Rain Destiny, DWC, come on, good evening. Hey, everybody stand up. I got to pray before bringing the word of God. I just want to say hello to all the campuses, the family that's gathered together. I do feel like I'm with my family when I'm here. I have the utmost respect for your pastors, Pastor Steve, Pastor Jackie, Pastor Stephen. Pastor Stephen is brought such a breath of fresh air, innovation into this church. I am so proud of Stephen Vigalis, okay? I love you. I'm so proud of you. And I just want to say that I, I have such a deep love for this church, and it's, it's interesting. I literally did just travel around the world and ministered to people from all over the world. And yet I come to this church, and I, uh, I have such a weight, I feel, because of how much I love you, because of how much I want to see you fi finish well. You know, you know what my number one goal is in ministry? This is number one. It trumps everything. And that is the day I leave this earth, I'm more in love with Jesus than the day I started ministry. Because I've watched so many people heartbreakingly walk away from the faith. I've watched so many fall from ministry. And I'm just like, Lord, I want to finish well. And I think about, you know, I think about he's the groom and we're the bride. And, and, and I think about, you know, a bride trying to just make it to the end. You know what my number one goal is in marriage? That the day Lisa Bevere leaves this earth, she loves me more than the day we got married. And then my number two goal in marriage is the day I leave this earth, I love her more than the day we got married. Because this is what it's all about. A marriage is an illustration of the way that church and Jesus are one. And I find God has taught me so much about my relationship with him through my relationship with my wife and what we have in our marriage covenant. And the thing I love about these leaders is they understand the importance of marriage and family. They emphasize the importance of covenant. And I believe that's why DWC is such a strong church here in this little tiny island with 12,000 people. And yet we've got thousands gathered tonight to hear the word of God. Thousands saying, I want to be renewed. Yeah. On a night that the Super Bowl champions are playing, a night that you've got the uh, baseball thing going up. Why are people in church? Because we're hungry. Yeah. Can you say amen? And there is a reason the Bible says that we are to exhort one another daily. It's because there is a very strong current of the world. And you know what? It's going exponentially. We've gone from a level two rapids to a level five rapids. He's the prince of the power of the air. God showed me one day. It's, he said the current of the world is like whitewater rapids. And unless you are pressing, 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 as Paul said, to attain the high call, you're going to eventually... You're going to put the oars up saying, I'm exhausted, and you're going to start flowing with that current, but your boat's still going to be pointed upstream. You're still going to look like a Christian, act like a Christian, know the language of a Christian, but you're going to be floating with the world. He's the prince of the power of the air. There's a strong current. And I'm telling you, it's gone to like a level five rapids. Right now, we're not in just the days of darkness. We're in the days of gross darkness. And right now, it's not like it was 40 years ago when I first started ministry. Right now, I feel like the most important thing is to arm God's people to finish well. Because when I look at Jesus coming back, there are virgins that were not ready. There were five of them that were not ready. And the thing I keep feeling so strongly is we are so on the verge of the return of Jesus Christ. And the thing that Jesus stresses over and over again is to watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. Watch and pray and be ready. And so I, I just believe that tonight God will give me a word that will strengthen you and keep you strong because you know what? I've grown to love this church so much, not just by being in this building. I see you guys all over the place and we're down here in our home down on 30A. I see you guys, you come up, you have the biggest radiant smiles. You have the greatest love, the greatest embrace. Oh, we're DWC people. And I, I, just, I just feel, you know, I just, I'm so proud of you for the way you've raised this family in such a healthy way. So thank you. Can you thank God for this pastor again? I love you, man. And there's a real good reason he's on our board, and that is because he is one of the wisest men I know. And so you need to thank God. And I don't care if all, my job is total job just to help you to understand what a great leadership family you have here. You have a great re leadership family. Because I've been traveling all over the world now for 35 years. I made a ministry 40 41 years, but I've been traveling all over the world and I've seen thousands of churches. We get so many people saying to us, hey, do you know where a good church is? And, and we, we, sometimes we can't give them an answer. So let me tell you, let me encourage you. God has blessed you here. 
with a man and woman of God and a family that really loves Jesus. Amen? Amen. Tonight, I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to say this at the end. I don't know what the Spirit of God's going to do, but I'm going to share with you out of the newest book I've written called The Awe of God. You know, it's funny. I was writing it two years ago when I was here for the renewal nights, and I preached on it, and we had a wonderful night together. But God just keeps expanding and expanding this in my heart. You know, it, 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 as far as books goes, Beta Satan passed six million copies last September. This book is so outperforming Beta Satan in its first year and a half. It's a word of mouth book. It's because literally I believe the awe of God, the healthy fear of God is what protects us and keeps us from falling away. Amen. I just want to pray and get right into the word of God. Our family is doing amazing. We got nine grandbabies now. We're waiting for number nine to come out due to, uh, I think Wednesday, Christian is due with number nine. Yeah, we've got pictures and all that, but I just, I want to get into the word. It just sense your hunger in here tonight. I sense the Holy Spirit wanting to do something in your hearts. Amen. So can we pray? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for an entire family of believers coming together and all our different campuses. And the thing that's so wonderful is there there is no distance in the spirit that we are all together before your throne. And Lord, you said when we do gather together to honor the name of Jesus, you would be in our midst. So I'm asking that you would increase your tangible presence. Lord, the best we've got as human beings is not good enough to change lives. But when the spirit of the living God comes, that is when there is liberty. So I'm asking, Holy Spirit of God, that you would speak to us tonight. Not yesterday's, not tomorrow's word, but what you're saying right now. For I know that you, your favorite thing to do is to exalt and to honor Jesus. And I'm asking you to do it tonight in a way like we've never, ever known it before. As you do this, may we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith and from strength to strength. For I decree your kingdom has come, your will shall be done in our places of worship on this earth as it is in heaven. And for this, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, and the thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody that agrees shouts. Come on, give him praise in advance for what God's going to do. Amen and amen. I want to open up with three scriptures. And just to show you the importance of what I'm, what I'm sharing with you, and that is the first one, Isaiah 33, verse 6, where we read, the prophet Isaiah writes, the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. I really want you to stop and think about God's treasure. Do you have treasures? How do you handle those treasures? What do you do with those treasures? Do you put them in junk drawers? Do you just leave them out in the front lawn at night? Or do you handle them carefully? The fear of the Lord, I want you to listen to these words, is God's treasure. If you look at Isaiah 11, verse 3, we read, the fear of the Lord is Jesus' delight. I find that to be amazing. His delight. If you look at Paul the Apostle in the New Testament, he writes and he says, work out your salvation. Not with love and kindness, But he says, work out your salvation. What does that mean? Bring it from the inside to the out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So let's think about this. We're talking about God's treasure. We're talking about Jesus' delight. And we're talking about the very thing that matures our salvation. Why aren't we talking more about this? I firmly believe that The reason we are seeing such a departure from the faith, and in case you haven't seen it, Barna did a deep dive study. Over 95,000 people were surveyed, but they discovered that over 30 million Americans have walked away from the faith in the last 24 years. Why has this happened? I believe it's because we've not emphasized God's treasure, Jesus' delight, and the very thing that matures our salvation. First of all, let me say this. The fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God because how can we ever have a relationship of intimacy with somebody we're afraid of? And this is God's number one desire for you. Number one is he wants to be intimate with you. In fact, he wants to be more intimate with you than you want to be with him. Did you hear what I just said? God wants to be more intimate with you than you want to be with him. So how can you be intimate with somebody you're afraid of? When Moses brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them right to the place he met with God. I just look at Moses and I'm so amazed because Moses saw the tremendous 
miracles that God did. He saw the Red Sea part. He saw God feed these people from bread that came from heaven. He literally saw God bring water out of a rock to give drink to so many millions of people. Yet he comes before the Lord and he says, show me your glory. I want more. And this is the thing that I find. When somebody is healthy, they've got an appetite. When somebody is sick, they have no appetite. Why is it the cancer patients go down to 108 pounds? Because they have no appetite because they're sick. One of the signs of backsliding is you lose your appetite for the presence of God, for the glory of God, for the word of God. And that's why I'm so thankful for a leader who will have spiritual renewal nights. Because this is why we are told over and over, exhort one another daily because there is a strong current. There is a masterful enemy behind the current of this world and he is trying to do anything he can to lure you away from what will make you most satisfied and that is the presence of God. Moses, when he brings the people out to the mountain, God comes down on that mountain and when he does, they all run away. And Moses is so perplexed because he's left everything in Egypt because he knows how wonderful the presence of God is, yet he looks at these people who were enslaved by Egypt, yet they're afraid of the presence of God. And he looks at them in Exodus 20, 20 and says, hey, do not fear, don't be afraid, because God's come to test you to see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. What is Moses saying? God wants to be intimate with you, but the only thing that's going to keep you from him is your sin. God makes a statement through the prophet Isaiah. He said, your sins have separated you from me. He doesn't say they've separated me from you. We separate ourselves. If you look at the apostle James, he writes to the church and he says, hey, you're seeking a friendship with the world. You are literally making yourself an enemy of God. And he's talking to believers. You know, I'm deeply in love with my wife. Matter of fact, we've been married 42 years just this past Wednesday. And I would marry her in a heartbeat again if I could. But you know what? We got a marriage certificate and I could legally hold that marriage certificate up and say, babe, I am married to you. But if I'm jumping in bed with other girls, I guarantee you I'm going to lose something with her. And that's intimacy. She's not going to be sharing the secrets of her heart with me as our heads are on the pillow. I might be technically still married, although she is a sharpshooter and she told me she would make it painless if I did. However, (laughs) however, what I'm going to lose is that intimate intimacy with her. I don't want to lose it. And James makes this statement. He says, hey, you're seeking a friendship with the world. You, believer, are making yourself an enemy of God. I would make myself an enemy to Lisa Bevere if I started sleeping around with other women. I would have a very, very, very hot-headed Sicilian on my hand. And she wouldn't be intimate with me. And we just think that God, you know, we've preached this message in the Western church so much so that it's an unbalanced message of almost like you can live any way you want and still have an intimate relationship with God. I've got news for you. There's over 500 commands in the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying the commands are given to an establish a relationship. No. We, we have 600 commands in the Old Testament, a little over 600 commands. Those commands were given to prove that we could never, ever, ever, ever live good enough to have a relationship with God by doing good works. We couldn't obey God's word. We couldn't establish a relationship. So what are the commands in the New Testament? They're given to enhance our relationship. You know, Lisa and I were married and we didn't have, we had had a couple stints there that it was a little rough for us. And Pastor Steve asked us to go and see a marriage counselor. And for two days, right down here at his house, that marriage counselor ripped my soul out and put it back in in a healthy way. Did the same for Lisa on the next day. That was about eight or nine years ago. Do you know our marriage has been absolutely amazing since? Do you know Lisa constantly says John Bevere is my favorite husband? I'm like, Lisa, what in the world does that mean? She says, there is John Bevere 1.0 and there's John Bevere 2.0. She said, I like the John Bevere 2.0 so much better. And so, yeah, I, I was technically married, but we were struggling. And I'm just wondering how many people out there 
are like finding dissatisfaction in their walk with God. Why? Because he's not revealing his intimate secrets with them. Because the Bible says friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them, he shares his secrets. I look at Abraham. Abraham knows what God's going to do before he does it. I look at Lot. They're both saved. Lot's as clueless as the world. The judgment is about to come. On the day it happened, it took two messengers of mercy, two angels, because Abraham prayed to get him out. But here's Abraham, and God says, I'm going to discuss with this man what I'm going to do. Hey, Abraham, what do you think? I'm thinking about blowing up these cities. What do you think? And they talk it through. But here's another righteous man who's as clueless as the world. Jesus makes a statement. He said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Are the commandments to bring us in bondage? No, they're to enhance our relationship with God. The person that obeys the Lord is the person who is blessed. The person who takes advantage of the Lord and tries to run his grace out as far as I can and live as close to the world as I can is a person that is so torn, so miserable, and they eventually walk away. I believe this is why we've lost 30 million people. So let me ask something. What cultivates our fear of the Lord? Because it is the fear of the Lord that gives us the ability to endure to the end. I will never forget when I sat with the famous evangelist in the federal penitentiary. He had the largest ministry on the planet in the 1980s. Yet he was arrested and sentenced. And I remember he read one of the books that I wrote in his fourth year of prison in 1994. I walked into that prison cell. At his request, I had never met him. I had just seen him on CNN every single night. I saw his trial. I saw his judgment. And I remember him saying, John, this prison wasn't God's judgment on his, my life. It was actually his mercy. Because if I would have continued living the way I was living, I would have ended up in hell forever, separated from God. And I remember when he said that, I thought, oh, wow. He said, there was so much wickedness in me. Here he is. The, he had the largest television ministry in the world. He would weep when he was preaching. And I remember after him telling me the whole story, how God sent a man into his prison, the first year of prison, to deliver him. He said, there was so much wickedness in me. And I looked at him and I said, hey, here's my number one question. I'm 35 years old. You're 55. I don't want to end up where you ended up. Amen. When did you fall out of love with Jesus? At what point in your ministry? He said, John, I didn't. And I remember my walls went up and I thought, wait a minute. What? What do you mean you didn't? He said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And he saw the confusion on me and he said, John, I didn't fear God. And he said, there are millions of Americans, Christians like me. They love Jesus. They have no fear of God. The fear of the Lord was Jesus' delight. Fear of the Lord is Jesus' delight. The fear of the Lord is God's treasure. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So what it cultivates, what cultivates, what grows our holy fear of God? That's the question I want to ask tonight. The answer is none other than the awareness that we have of his glory. I'm going to say it again. What causes our fear of God, our holy fear to grow? It's the awareness, the knowledge, the comprehension of his glory. Now, the problem is when I say the glory of the Lord, half of us sit there and kind of go, what is the glory of the Lord? I mean, there are so many people, you say the glory of the Lord. First of all, they, 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 it, it seems too mysterious to even talk about it, so they don't talk about it. Then you've got the people that use it flippantly. Oh, we were in the meeting the other night and the glory fell. Yeah, I don't think you'd be here talking about it if it did. <laughs> Quite like you are. Then you've got the other people that think, well, the glory of the Lord's a cloud. Because every time you hear about the glory of God in the Bible, it just seems like there's this cloud, right? Well, first of all, what is it? To, in order to understand what the glory of the Lord is, we have to realize that God is light. That's why you got this cloud every time it's talked about in the Bible. Because God is so brilliant, he's so bright, that he has to hide himself in a cloud, a dark cloud, so that everybody around him doesn't die. Okay? Are you following me? Yeah. Jesus makes, or Paul makes the statement. 
He says, Jesus dwells, listen to this, in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. How does Paul know this? He experienced it himself on the road to Damascus. See, you got to realize the Bible says God is a consuming fire. The Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So when you think about a consuming light, fire, what do you think about? What's the first thing you think about? You think about the sun. The sun is a consuming fire, right? It's unapproachable and it's a consuming fire. But yet the sun has dark spots. So you can't think about the sun because he's much more brilliant than the sun. I mean, Paul, listen to this. This is amazing. Paul makes this statement to a king. He's witnessing to a king. He's telling a king about Jesus. And he's telling his story about when he got converted. And he said, king, at midday, I want you to look at the scripture. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter. Everybody say brighter. Than, than the sun that was shining around me. Okay, at midday. Stop, 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 stop. I've traveled all over the world. I go to countries all the time and I forget my sunglasses and you know what, I'm fine without my sunglasses. When I went to the Middle East the first time, when I went outside and tried to go out without sunglasses, my eyes were like this. Why? It's at the equator. The terrain is very bright and reflective, and there's no humidity like there is here. So that means all the rays are unobstructed. I couldn't believe how bright it was. Now, 8 o'clock in the morning wasn't so bad. 4 o'clock in the afternoon, not so bad. But right around 11, 12, 1 o'clock, Paul says, at midday. Okay, this is when the sun's its brightest in the Middle East. He said there was a light from heaven brighter than the Middle Eastern noonday sun. Are you beginning to get capture why the Bible tells us that when Jesus returns, the sun's going to be turned to darkness? The moon's not going to give its light? Stars aren't going to shine? Some of you are getting it. Some of you aren't. Let me help you. Tonight, it's going to be a clear night. We walk outside. What are we going to see in the night sky? Stars. Everywhere stars. What happens tomorrow morning when the sun comes up? Do the stars go, okay, guys, the sun's coming. He's coming. Okay, he's coming. Wham! And then the sun just goes. And right when the sun starts going down, the stars are going, get ready. He's going down. He's going down. Bam! No. The stars are there. The glory of the sun is one level. The glory of the stars is another level. The glory of the sun is so much greater than the glory of the stars that it darkens them even though they're still shining. Well, when Jesus returns, now you're getting it. The sun is still going to be shining, but the brilliance, the brightness, the glory is so great, it's going to darken the sun. Is this why the men of the earth are going to cry out for the rocks to fall on top of them and hide them from the face of him who's coming? What is the glory of the Lord? Moses said to God, he said, show me your glory. The word glory means the full weight of majesty, splendor, and honor. You have to realize that God appears to people in the Old Testament he, had, he actually eats with Abraham. He wrestles with Jacob. If you look at Joshua, he says, are you for us or for you, are you for our enemies? And he says, neither. I am the commander of the Lord of hosts. And Joshua gets down and worships him. These people saw the Lord, but not in his glory. If you look, though, when God came in his glory, there had to be a dark cloud. If you remember when God came down on the mountain with Israel, all it says in Exodus 20, verse 18, all of Israel looked and the people were afraid and they trembled with fear and moved backwards and stood afar off. 
Well, that's because, you know, maybe they weren't really godly. Well, let's talk about the godly ones. How about Moses? I don't think there was anybody more godly than Moses in his entire generation. Yet when God comes down on the mountain, look what it says in Hebrews. He's, it's so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I trembled with fear. See, I think we're forgetting who we're serving. If you look at Job, do you know, do you know God said that Job is the most, listen, the most godly man on the planet? Okay, now, somebody says, she's the most godly person I know. You go, yeah, yeah, that's your opinion, and that's great, and she probably is really godly. But when God Almighty says, this is the most, there is not another man on the entire planet Earth that's more godly than this man, Job. Look what Job says when he sees the Lord. He said, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. I heard about you at church, but now my eye sees you. I utterly abhor myself. What happened? For the first time, he realized who it was he was serving. And for the first time, it re he realized who he was before this holy God. How about Isaiah? Isaiah is the most godly man in his entire generation. Isaiah gets transported out of his body, put down right before the throne of God. And when he sees the Lord, first thing he notices are the massive angels that are crying, what? Holy. You know what's interesting? They're crying holy so loud, they're shaking an arena that seats over a billion people. And what's interesting is, and this is one big shout, and a writer, in he, a Hebrew writer would write a word three times to put great, the greatest emphasis on it that you could put on it. Only happens about five times in the Bible. They would write it twice to put emphasis, but three times means you can't emphasize the word anymore. They're crying holy. In other words, every moment, another facet of God's glory is being revealed and all one's do, crying to the other is holy. And they're crying it so loud, they're shaking a, an arena that seats over a billion people. Isaiah sees the Lord, he doesn't go, dude, there's the man upstairs. Whoa, <laughs> finally meeting him. No, Isaiah cries out, woe is me. I am completely undone. Literally means I'm coming apart at the seams because my eye has seen the king. If you look at Peter, James, and John, when they went out, I read this just this morning. This is what really inspired me. They go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were terrified and fell face down when God spoke. God came in the bright cloud and they were terrified and fell face down. If you look at Jesus, John sees him on the deserted island of Patmos, and John was the closest disciple. And John said, I fell down like a dead man when I saw him. What is the glory of God? It's everything that makes God, God. Nothing is hidden or held back. It's when he reveals his full on power, his glory, his goodness, his love. Everything that makes God is revealed. The thing is, we are told in Isaiah 45 verse 15, and this is where I wanted to get to, that God is a God who hides himself. Now, this is where I wanted to get to. We have four sons. All four sons are godly. They're all walking with Jesus. They've all worked with us at Messenger International for at least nine years. But I remember back in the 1990s, Michael Jordan was playing, winning his six national championships. And I remember all I'm hearing around the house is Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. There's posters of Michael Jordan everywhere. It was starting to grate on me. And I remember we were on the east coast of Florida and the church that we were ministering at put us on a hotel right on the beach. And the surf just happened to be pounding that day. And you know boys, you know, they were like ages 13 down to five. They love body surfing. So they were getting literally pounded into the sand. They had sand in their hair, sand in their mouth, sand in their suits. And after a couple hours of just being pounded by the surf, they had had it. And we were walking up to the room and I thought, now's my chance. Now is my chance. And I remember I said, Lisa, tell them we're going to have a dad talk. And she got them all wrapped up in towels. They're sitting on the bed. And I on purpose went and opened the sliding door so they could hear the pounding surf. And I said, guys, that's a pretty strong ocean out there, isn't it? They went, oh yeah, dad, it sure is. I said, do you know if a meteor one mile wide hits the ocean out there? A hundred miles out, hits the ocean, one mile wide meteor. 
it will create a tidal wave that will wipe out every single major city on the east board of the United States. Every single one. New York City will be no more. Charlotte, North Carolina, or, or uh, um, uh, anyway, all the coastal, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, will be no more. They're like, whoa. I said, hey, it's a big ocean, isn't it? They go, yeah. I said, you can only see one mile out. It goes another 4,000 miles. There's another one on the other side, even bigger. And then there's two others beside that. I said, you know, God weighed every drop of water, every drop in the palm of his hands. And I said, now you're impressed because this guy can jump from a 15 foot line and put a ball through a hole. And they went, we got it. We got it. We got it, dad. We got it. We got it. Now, you know what's, what's amazing? We watched, we watched the games. But Michael Jordan got back into, he got back into perspective because God's hid his glory to see if we're going to get off on the talented movie stars, the beautiful, handsome movie stars, the guru businessmen, or if we're going to see his glory in our hearts. Because you see, here's the thing. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God has made his light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's God. He's prepared us for his glory. He's prepared us to stand in the presence of his glory. That's his goal for us. But the question is, are we going to get enamored by what's in the world? And when you look at all we've got on our iPhones, it can easily distract us from the glory that's revealed in our hearts. Now, why is that glory so important? Because the Bible says that we're changed from glory to glory as we behold him. You don't behold him on Instagram. You behold him by seeking him in your heart. And this is what changes us. The more we behold him, the more we become like him. The more we become like him, the more we see him. The more we see him, the more we become like him. The enemy wants to pervert that ability for you to open the eyes of your heart and see him by getting you enamored by what's going on in Instagram, Facebook, and everything else to keep you distracted in a way because he knows that's the power to change you. See, let me tell you something. When you're put in prison, when I went to Vietnam and we preached, and we preached to 4,000 pastors in Vietnam in 2017, I had dinner with the five most prominent pastors in Vietnam. They had teeth missing from the torture that they went through because they spent the previous 20 years more in prison than free. They were in and out of prisons and they were tortured for their faith. And yet their faces radiated. They were so happy we were there. And by the end of the dinner, I said, Lisa, what in the world are we doing teaching these people? They should be teaching us. But what happened? When you're in prison, you're being beaten. You have this ability to turn inside as a believer. And you have the ability to behold in your heart the glory of the Lord. But if your senses dominate you, you're not going to be able to see. Because what we spend time in is what we build. We build either our flesh or we build our spirits. And there's just no other way. This is why Paul says to Timothy, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, because your profiting will appear to everyone. We want this outward Christianity, but we're not willing to do what it takes to really seek him in our hearts. I've been, I've, been, I've been on a quest. I'm watching so many leaders fall, and I'm like, why are they falling? Why are they falling? And so this year, I had the privilege of being with a couple that have gone over 50 years of ministry, with a few. I shouldn't say a couple, a few. Why are you so successful? 
Listen, you know what they said? My time in prayer. I still get up early in the morning and I seek God. I still read the Bible every single day. You know, think about it. Paul is looking at these elders in Ephesus and these are elders that he has appointed In Acts chapter 20, he said, guys, you're not going to see my face again until we get to heaven. Oh my gosh, think about it. These are the people he loves and cares about. He can't text them. He can't get on the cell phone and do a FaceTime. He can't even do an email. And if he writes a letter, it's going to take months Do you understand? This man is thinking I and saying goodbye to these people I have put in leadership and I will not see them again until heaven. What are you going to say to them? The very final words he says, he says, and now brothers, I commend you to God. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance. He's saying, guys, you've got to spend time in the word of God. You know, the way the Lord showed it to me one day is he said, son, because you live in a corrupt world, you have to recalibrate. You know, I was bothered. There was a man who was one of the largest, he was the largest ministry in the world after the other man that I visited in prison fell. He became the largest in the world. He fell. And I remember him making a statement one day and he said, you know, I've been reading the Bible for over 40 years and there's just some days it's really hard to open up that Bible. And I thought, I don't want to ever be, something inside of me went wrong, wrong. Something's really, really, really wrong. And I thought, I don't want to be like that. And you know, that man, his ministry fell and it never recovered. And so my boys tell me all the time, they say, Dad, we remember we're getting up at 5.30, coming down, getting ready to school, and there's your light on in your office. Because why? I live in a fallen world that has a current, that has a flow, and I've got to recalibrate. I've got to refire. And it's the living word. And the, what makes the difference is I've told my sons, I've said to them, you have got to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you Jesus as you read the Bible. Somebody asked me recently, they said, do you like praying or do you like reading the Bible better? And I'm like, I don't know. Praying, I'm talking to God. Reading the Bible, he's talking to me. But you see, most people read the Bible and it's boring. And the reason it's boring is because they're not asking the Holy Spirit to teach them, to reveal Jesus to them. It's just, I'm sorry. We live in an instant, quick society. And we just want, we just want the formula. Just tell me the formula because... You know, it's like saying, I just want the formula to have a decent marriage so I can do what I really want to do. So I can coast. So I can relax. I I just, I don't see a place for relaxing. If you're looking for a place to relax, I I, I just, I I don't know how you're going to make it. Those 10 bridegrooms were asleep because the bridegroom delayed his coming. They must have fell asleep because why? They didn't stay alert. They didn't stay watchful. Why is it that five of them, why were their lamps going out at the end? Jesus said the kingdom of God's like a, like 10, 10 virgins, 10 virgins. Listen to me. Five are wise, five are foolish. Why? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the difference? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The wise were wise enough to be able to stay true to the end. Okay, I I, I used to read that parable. I would be so bothered. I'd say, I don't get it. God, I just don't get it. Because I'd read the parable and they were were all kind of sleeping. And then the, the shout came, the bridegroom's coming. And they all woke up and they trimmed their laps. The five wise trimmed theirs, the five foolish trimmed theirs. And they said, oh no, our oil is running out. So the wise looks at the foolish, and the wise said to the foolish, first of all, the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oils, our, lamp, our lamp's going out. And the wise says, we, we won't have enough for us and you. And this is what the wise said, and Jesus actually says this, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. 
Now, for years, I didn't understand this. One morning, I just was like, I was out praying in the remote area, and I just screamed. I said, God, you've got to show me what you're talking about. I just don't get it. And that day, he opened my eyes. It was the most miraculous thing. I want you to picture this. Ten virgins walk into a Bass Pro Shop. Okay? It's good enough. The five foolish walk up to the counter, and they put down their money. They say, give me that lamp, which lamp speaks of light, speaks of salvation. They're all virgins. They're not harlots. They're virgins. They're looking for the return of the bridegroom. Give me that lamp. They put the money down. <sighs> Thank God I'm saved. I got light. The five wise walk up to the counter. They pull everything out of their pockets. They say, this is all my savings, all my checking. This is all my CDs I cashed in. This is all my IRAs I cashed in. This is everything I got. Give me that lamp, and with all the rest of it, I want all the oil you'll, you'll buy. So the wise gave their entire life. The foolish gave only what they thought was required to be saved. They kept part of their life back. The fear of the Lord won't let you do that. The fear of the Lord centers you. It helps you to realize what's really important and what's not. It helps you to realize what pulls you away and what doesn't. It keeps you humble. It keeps you realizing, like a pastor that would stand up and go, can you believe what God's done? Instead of going, we've worked hard to get this. He's like, I know God did this. I'm not this smart. I'm not this, I'm not, I'm not this attractive. I'm not this good. I had, I had guys look at me on the plane last night. They, they, they just smiled and said, man, we love your books. <laughs> I just looked at them and said, you know why my name's on that book? Because I was the first guy to get to read it. I said, those messages are from heaven. <laughs> and they both laughed, just like you guys. Because I realized I'm not that smart. The five wise gave everything. I'm going to ask you something. And I want you to be honest with yourself. I want to give you a little, I want to give you a little, uh, little image here. Picture this. You got a young man. His name's Matt. Matt gets down on one knee. He's got the little ring box and opens it up. He's in front of his girlfriend, Sarah, right? He says, hey, Sarah, will you marry me? Sarah goes, yes, 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 yes. Oh, my gosh. She grabs him. She almost chokes him. She's so excited. This is the day I've been waiting for. Yes, I'll marry you. So they celebrate. And after a few minutes, Sarah looks at Matt and goes, well, you know, Matt, I dated Tony in high school, and we went steady for two years. Can I have a couple nights with him a year? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I, I went steady with Peter at college, and, and I was actually pinned to him. I'd like a couple nights with him, but a, a year. But, but, but Matt, you're my favorite. I love you more than Peter. I love you more than Tony. Far more than Peter and Tony. You're my favorite. You get 360 nights a year with me. Is there any young man in America that would accept that? Any young man? Not one. I look at Jesus. He's our groom. How does he get down on the knees? He comes to this earth. This is our creator. Comes to this earth knowing that he's going to be despised, rejected. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be insulted. Then they're going to take him and strip his clothes off and blindfold him. Then they're going to start punching him. Say, who hit you? Tell us. They're going to slug him hard because these are mad soldiers. They're going to spit in his face. They're going to pluck every one of his beard, beard hairs out. They're going to shove thorns into his skull. And I mean really, really sharp thorns like nails. nails. They're, going to, they're going to beat him. Je Jesus knows this. They're going to beat him. Then they're going to whip him. They're going to take these whips with lead tips and bone fragments. And they're going to, they're going to run him across their back, his back. Now, this is what really gets me. In Isaiah 52, Jesus knows this. Remember? 
It says by the time he gets to the cross, he's not even going to have the appearance of a human being. He will be so beaten and tortured. Then he lets them drive these nails into his hand and feet, and he dies the most gruesome, terrifying death that a human being could die in those days. And he knows it. And yet he willfully does it because of how much he loves his bride. That's him getting down on one knee saying, will you be my girl forever? Amen. And we think he's coming back for a church. He says, well, let me just have a few nights a year in bed with the world. You'll be my favorite. I'll even listen to worship music. I'll even serve in the church. But let me just sleep with the world a few nights a year. Do we really believe that? See, the enemy figured something out with the early church. So the more I persecute these guys, the more I throw them into dens with lions and, and wild beasts, and the more I burn them at the stake, the more I crucify them, the more passionate they become. Let me give them a casual Christianity. Let, let me give them a fun Christianity. Let, let me give them one that's, uh, that's cool. You know, it's the first time in 2,000 years it's been cool to be a Christian, the last 20 years. First time. I can't think of another time in history it was cool to be a Christian, cool to be a ministry. Those people in Vietnam, when they said, I'm going to serve you and I'm going to, go, I'm, going to become a, I'm going to become an overseer, they knew what they were going up against. I just met with leaders from Iran. There's such a revival going on in Iran. Why? Because they're so persecuted. It's a hard place to serve Jesus, the United States, because we have so much for our flesh, so much to distract us. I just want to say this because I love you so much, and I'm going to close. I love you so much that tonight I had a whole message planned. I, I, I really did. And I stayed with it a little bit. I just want to see you finish well. I want to see this church strong. I want to see you so on fire that people at work say, what is it about you? What makes you so different? It's not that you're cool. It's not that you have a smile on your face. It's that you've got joy in you that I don't see in others. It's that you have a hope in you that I don't see in others. It's that you have discipline in you that I just don't see in others. I don't know about you. But I think it's more important how we finish than how we start. Amen. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes and I want you to be really honest. I'm going to speak to all the campuses right now. The Apostle Paul made this statement so clear. He said, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one. He said, this is actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. God gave us a living illustration to show how to have an authentic relationship with him. It's not praying a sinner's prayer. I mean, Sarah was more than willing to pr pronounce vows to Matt, but she still wanted a couple nights with, Matt, uh, with Tony, a couple nights with Peter. You know, my wife, when she said yes to me and she walked down that aisle, I've been all over the world. I've never once questioned it was she would flirt with another man, engage with another man. Oh, we had things to work on. Believe me, she wasn't perfect the first day, the first week, the first year. But what I've never questioned is her faithfulness to me. And I never will. We're not talking about being perfect outwardly. We're talking about a perfect heart. We're talking about, I'm laying my life down for him. He laid his life down for me. I'm laying my life down for him. So here's my question to all campuses, all campuses. Have you done what that bride does on her wedding day? Or do you still flirt? Do you still give your phone number to the very things Jesus died for? Lisa flirted with guys before we got married, but she didn't after we got married. She gave her phone number to guys before we got married, not after we got married. She dated other guys before we got married, not after we got married. Jesus is inviting you into the most wonderful relationship that you can have in the universe a covenant with your creator.
intimacy with your creator. That's what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. If you're in here tonight and you'd say, hey, John, I haven't done what that bride does and I want to do it. I want to give my life to him the way he gave his life to me. I want to give him everything, my entire heart. Then I want you to lift up your hands high right now all over this building and the other buildings. You say, John, I haven't done what that bride does, but I want to do it right now. Put your hand up high. Wow, I'm looking at a couple hundred hands up in the air right now. I want you to just stand to your feet if your hands are raised. In every campus, I want you to just stand to your feet. Yeah, this is a call. The times are dangerous right now, and that's why the call is so strong. That's why it's so clear, and that's why it's so clear. It's because the enemy's trying harder than ever to pull you away, and I don't want you being pulled away. So if you're in all of our campuses, I want you to stand and I want you to stand here and pastors and all of our campuses. I want you to minister to these men and women that are standing right now. If you're standing in this building, you say, John, that's me. I'm ready to do what that bride does. I want you to come forward. I want you to move out into the aisles and come on down. I want to pray for you. And can we give them a hand as they come? Come on, come on down. If you're standing, come on down, come on down, come on, come on all the way down. Hey, I'm so proud of you. Come here. I'm so proud of you and you and you. Come on, come on, give them a hand. And you, and you. I'm so proud of you. And you, and you. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I'm so proud of you guys. So proud of you. Come on, give them a hand. Come on, so proud of you guys. So proud of you. I'm so proud of you and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, sir. Come on, keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Okay, now wait a minute. Wait a minute now. If, 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 hold on. Bow your heads one more time. I, I, I feel a little pull. If you're, if you're sitting and you wanted to be standing, ask yourself, why aren't you? Why aren't you standing? Well, I'll decide later, one day later. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Later may come, but your heart may be harder. It may be harder for you to hear the next time. Ask yourself why. Why are you sitting when you really want to be down here with these people, with, with all these beautiful people? If you want to be down here, I want you to just stand up right now and just get up and come down. There's a couple more of you out there. I know it. Just give them a hand as they come. Just come on down right now. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's it. So proud of you. So proud of you guys. Come on. I'm so proud of you. All right. Look at me. Everybody look at me. Can we, can we all stand? Because the presence of God is about to come in here. And I, and I want to reverence that. Can we go just a little bit lighter on the music? Can you guys look at me? Why do you have all these sad looks on your face? I mean, have you ever seen a bride walking down the aisle going, no way. She's got the biggest smile. This is the greatest day of your entire life. Can I tell you something? Listen, listen. There was a day, there was a day I prayed a sinner's prayer. And yet I was still very carnal, still very worldly. A couple years later, I put a chair in a room after hearing a man preach like what you just heard tonight. And I said, that chair is the throne of my heart. And I'm not leaving this room until you're on it and nothing or no one else. I walked around that chair for two hours. My head screaming at me, John, you're in ministry. You're working for the church. What are what, what you, what, you? My heart said, Judas left everything he had. Judas followed Jesus. Judas is in hell. I went, oh my gosh. And I remember I collapsed at that chair and I cried and I cried and I cried for two hours or for an hour and a half, excuse me, for half an hour. It was two hours I walked around the chair fighting. And when I knew it was done, I, I collapsed at that chair. I didn't know it was done. It's just something happened. This is what you're doing tonight. You've come to church. You've maybe come, you know, every Sunday even. But tonight you're saying, I'm giving everything to him. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care if I get persecuted, thrown into prison, because you know what? That might just happen with all of us in a few years. You realize that? So you might as well settle it now. You might as well lose your life and gain his life. I said, you might as well lose your life and gain his life. It's a good trade. Believe me, it's a really good trade. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to lift up your hands. And I want you to close your eyes. Why am I having you do this? Because I want you to open the eyes of your heart. 
If you could see the face of Jesus right now, let me tell you something. You wouldn't see a disgusted look. You wouldn't see angry eyes. You're going to see the biggest, biggest smile. Because you see, he gave you a free will and he was hoping you would respond. And you did. And he's, you know, you remember the prodigal? He said, I've been an idiot. And he started home. And he didn't even say a prayer. And his dad came running with gifts. Do you understand we haven't prayed yet? And the presence of God's already here. Lord, I'm asking that you would do that right now. I'm asking that you would manifest your presence. There's his presence right there, right there. A little softer, please. Softer, even on the volume. There's his presence. He's here already. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. There's his presence right there. Jesus. Wow, we haven't even prayed yet. He's here. I want you to say this. Dear Lord God, say it out loud, everyone, with your mouth. Dear Lord God, thank you for speaking to me tonight. I realize I've been in and out. I've lived my own way apart from you. That's ending tonight. Tonight, I'm fully yours. My spirit, soul, and body, everything I am, everything I have, it's yours. Jesus, you're my Lord, my King, my bridegroom. Now I'm asking you, baptize me in your spirit. Fill me with the Holy Fear of God. It's my treasure from you. Thank you. Help me to be wise. Lift your hands up one last time. There's his presence right there. Right there. Father, in Jesus' name, give us faithful and loyal hearts. May we be those, Lord God, that you keep strong to the end, that we may be found blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for the work that you've begun in these beautiful men and women. Let it be completed against that day in Jesus' name. There's his presence right there. Now just thank him right now. Give him praise. Give him praise. Come on.